Let me introduce my panel. Um, very quickly, on my left here is uh, Willem Buter. He is a special economic advisor for Citi. To his left, Stephen Eilers, managing partner and tax partner at Freshfields. And then going on, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Erwin Simon. He is a head of uh, Haines Celestial Group, uh, founder, president, and CEO. And then Tim Wu, professor at Columbia Law School, who uh, coined the term net neutrality. Um, Tim, you didn't get to have any of the conversation in the back room, so I have no idea what you think about this, which is why I'm randomly going to assign the first question to All you. All right, let me have it. All right? <laughs> sure. For 100. Um, oh, okay. So one of the conversations that went on here today is this idea of deglobalization. I have very, it's very difficult for me to think that any of the things that the people that were in this chair just before us talked about are going to happen and this world is going to deglobalize. Mm -hmm. I feel my personal opinion, which I don't necessarily like starting a question that way, is we're in a period of a pendulum swinging back a little bit, right. a two steps forward, one step back. Do you make a case that the world right now is deglobalizing? Um, I would make the case that it's not realistic to talk about everything moving in one direction all at once or, or the other. Um, so that, that just that's, undermines right. the entire question, Tim. Um, <laughs> but look, I think there. I, I don't mind. I'll, I'll take the, I'll take the argument that it is uh, the world is uh, deglobalizing. Um, I think that um, certainly as a policy matter, the, the sort of fascination and the uh, I think intellectual consensus in favor uh, of free trade has has eroded. Uh, it's not just one of the American, uh, major American political parties, but I think it's a, it, it's a trend uh, reflected also uh, in Europe and around uh, the world. And you know, I think that leads in, in natural uh, directions. I also think some of the most important, we talked during this day, there's a lot of talk about <coughs> importance of movements and sort of consciousness. And uh, you know, I think there is, uh, maybe it's mostly elites, but I think there's an increased sort of interest in, in people's own communities, buying local and, and trying to support local economies. Now, how much does that really matter? I don't know, but it's certainly a trend. And so, at least from the extreme of, of, of deglobalization, uh, of globalization, I'd say there, there's certainly a, at least a, a bounce backwards. Now, you, you were just talking about, you know, doesn't, doesn't something like, uh, uh, and actually, I'll add one very important issue to this, which is the uh, internet, I think, was large, was, was in the 90s particular, thought, well, this is obviously going to flatten every border, get rid of the relevance of, of jurisdictions, and, and erase everything. Tom Friedman had a book, uh, the, the World is Now Flat, or whatever. But I think that has really changed. And you only have to look, let's say, the entertainment industry, uh, where you know, companies like, like Hulu or, or Netflix are, are very, very geographic in how they, they do their business. Um, you know, there's a lot of filtering, uh, making sure people within borders respect different kinds of copyright. Uh, and so I think that that force, that sort of imagination, imagined extent of globalization is certainly uh, retreated. Now, how are we compared to the 18th century? That's a different story. But let I me, think uh, that things have me, gone in. throw this to Erwin. In many ways, what your business is is the embodiment of globalization. And, and at the same time, you have an administration right now that's talking about tough trade barriers with a place that you do a lot of business, China. Um, there are existing barriers in the country, and certainly from, say, compared to the early 90s, the world is not getting any bigger from a commercial regional standpoint, right, for places to sell your goods. It's not getting bigger. And the real question right now is, can you hold on to what you've got? <laughs> so the world is not getting bigger. If anything, the world is getting a lot smaller. Now, somebody who runs a business, who is a founder, who started a company in 1993, and prior to that, who'd never been to India, and the only thing he knew about India was how to order Indian food at an Indian restaurant, okay? And the same with China, the same with the Middle East, et cetera. So our company today has operations in India, Middle East, China, Africa, Europe, and the rest of the world. My fastest growing businesses are in all those countries today. And thank God we entered those many years ago to get our footprint. Now, as you were saying, local matters and educating the farmers, 
on not using pesticides and, and local buying, et cetera, is so important. I was telling this team, I have a team over in China today as we speak, working with Alibaba and the whole way you purchase over there. And the first question is, you know, how does everything going on with trade agreements right now affect you? But that's all they want is Western products. How do I get your baby products? How do I get your personal care products? And you know, Steve asked me before, you know, we have 39 plants around the world. How are we going to manufacture those? We are building our first plant in, A in India today. We are building our first plant in China, and we'll look to build plants in China and Europe to support that. So from a standpoint, you know, from a globalization, it's important. And I got to tell you, for my growth, it is so important today as I grow outside the U.S., as growing inside the U.S. And, and I'm going to face these trade barriers. I'm going to face all these but I'm going to have to figure it out because it's so important to the growth of my business. Stephen, I'm going to skip you for just a second and start with Willem. Willem, you're, you're, you're pessimistic about this. Not you think really. this is a real retrenchment? Um, the good news is that deglobalization is not a global phenomenon. Uh, just think about it. Emerging markets aren't deglobalizing. China is opening up. Yeah, right. they want globalization Chinese style, but I tell you, in 1945, Americans wanted globalization American style. India opening up, reaching out. Um, Brazil moving in the right direction. Argentina. The only EMs that are deglobalizing are North Korea, right, and Venezuela, right? So keep that in mind. Now, is it an advanced economy phenomenon? Well, yes, but it really is a Europe and US phenomenon. Even among the advanced economies, I can give you at least four countries that are not you know, anti-globalization in the sense of anti-trade, anti-immigration, anti-cross-border movement of ideas, uh, anti-capital movements, and these are Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and Japan. Yes, Japan is inward-looking, very inward-looking society, but less so than it used to be. It's opening up. Now, what have these four countries got in common? Because there are lessons there, and that's why some pessimism is also <laughs> overdue. First, all four have among the most equal income distributions. So the gains from globalization and from technical change have been more, much more evenly distributed than is the case in the US, especially the UK, the two countries where populism has actually triumphed at the polls, right? The only two in Europe or, or North America. Second, uh, and same holds for the distribution of wealth. Second, uh, they are, except for Japan, three of the four, uh, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand, have the highest social mobility, intergenerational mobility. And one of the reasons people are really <coughs> upset about immigration and about uh, you know, getting undermined uh, by uh, foreign competition is that many parents fear, for the first time in generation, that their kids are going to be worse off than they are. Right? And, that's, uh, now, and third, none of these four countries right, was particularly hard hit by the great financial crisis. Right? And populism and anti-globalization sentiment tends to result from deep recessions, but only ones that have been triggered by financial crises. That seems to be empirical regularity, don't know why. And finally, and this is a problem, I think, uh, all four countries share that they're too far to swim. Right? <laughs> So there is no large-scale threat of uh, you know, unwanted and feared immigration. And that's something we're going to have to live with. Let me bring Stefan into the conversation here. Uh, I just want to point out, Willem, we do a quarterly economic poll here at CNBC, and the, the numbers supporting trade in the American public are continuously strong. Mm -mm. Uh, those who see China as a threat has gone down the percentage has gone down. Um, the, the, the numbers on Canada and Mexico remain strong, and those who see benefits of free trade rather than costs have gone up. Um, Stefan, one of the things that's happening here in the United States is we've sort of brought our tax code more in line with foreign countries. Um, what kind of impact is that going to have on international companies and how they operate here in the States and whether they operate here in the States? 
I think the, the, the tax code, which basically has a reduction of your corporate tax rate and the possibility to depreciate everything you buy immediately, expense everything you buy immediately in the US, was a great argument for coming to the US. I think from a tax policy standpoint, very successful tool. I compare it with the honeypot, basically, and all the European, especially the European CFO bees, they, they now swarm and think about the US. Because the psychological element of reducing um, the headline number of making profits here is immense. And you see reactions from companies like Siemens or Volkswagen or Airbus all thinking about production in the US and this is tax code driven. And I think that, that was, is, a, is a great development and that is seen, I think, here I was one, one day at NYU teaching there on this, seen much more critical than from Europe. It's completely different to other things. Europe is in, in many aspects very critical to the US, but tax policy-wise and getting something moved in that dimension, I mean 45% tax rate down, this is an incredible movement and has restored quite a bit of credibility of your administration. To what extent is there a danger that's a race to the bottom though when it comes to or is I can offer companies less than you can, and you can then all of a sudden we erode the, At the base US, of public US finance. US has a top rate, yeah? So you had to do something on the rate. And I think tax competition fundamentally is nothing bad. Race to the bottom will not, will not happen because in your pendulum example, yes, the US is now moving a little bit to the, to the medium area. At some point in time, the Europeans will move a little bit and then it goes back if we see that the public revenues are not... See, I think of it a bit like, and, and I don't mean this pejoratively against any other country in the world, but um, I think of us a bit like the Ritz-Carlton, right? And if the Ritz-Carlton rate is, is 300, and you're the days in, you can't charge 300. You gotta charge 250. But if the Ritz-Carlton goes down to 250, the days in's gotta go down to 200. So I'm expecting, maybe I'm crazy about this, and I don't know, maybe everyone has a thought about this, that other countries are gonna to have to pivot because when you're 25% or 20% of global GDP, you're much more the price maker than you are the price but, taker. But this it's would happening. be a very welcome Macron. move. Macron is thinking of now going below 30. Yeah. UK basically under, under Brexit pressure right. as well is going down. I mean, it has triggered really your, your example. Yeah. It's already happening. The, it's happening. Yeah, so wait, why are you saying it's not a race to the bottom? It sounds like every condition for a race to the bottom. The, the, the bottom... <laughs> as he suggests, right? no, or a race down. How's that, that? That's, that's good news. No, that's I'm good. just saying, I'm asking. It's good news because it depends on. you can't tax really mobile factors. Companies are increasingly mobile, right? And it probably remain that way. Uh, although, again, there are some restraints imposed. And so the corporate tax base as a tax base will erode. And um, you have to therefore tax things that don't move. Land is my favorite, of course, that is really hard to move, but uh, people <laughs> and consumers move a lot less. But they, and so that's where the taxation sounds like, have sounds to like your, your prescription for the problem that you discussed earlier, which is inequality within countries, cannot be and will not be resolved then. Not as a corporation tax. But be very difficult to resolve through the taxation system. No, not at all. Um, there's no technical obstacle, there's a political obstacle. In this country, there's no tradition of aggressive redistribution, right? In parts of Europe, there is. And I think this is going to be a big competitive advantage for Europe because it will be easier there to share the fruits of globalization and robotics and artificial intelligence more equitably and more fairly than it is in this country. It's going to be a huge problem that there is this social consensus against the confiscatory role of the state, so to speak. But I, I think, again, it comes back to, you know, where are we going to be domiciled? And as you said, Siemens and all these companies now want to move to the U.S. because of our tax rate. And, you know, Europe, U.K. are not going to give up those tax rates to lose those, com those companies. The other thing is, you know, as I was saying in there, there used to be 12 thousand public companies. There's 4,500 public companies today, and it doesn't matter if you're public or, or private. But again, where are you creating the jobs? Where are you, you creating value? And that's the big thing at the end of the day. It, it's great those companies will come here and be domiciled for the tax reasons, but what's, what ultimately 
are we creating just you know from a, a lower tax rate and again i come back and say this here but, you know but there, um, yeah, but there be a response right there already is macron and others in europe propose that instead of taxing the profits where you declare them, which indeed means that you, <laughs> you can take them anywhere, you tax them when they're yeah. earned. It's basically okay. a sales tax. But the important thing in this, we, we, we talked about deliberalization and the processes get, get less coordinated. Right. Mm -hmm. And now yeah, we, we, are, we, are going, we are going to see this in the tax area where we have tax policies which go now against each other. European Commission going after a Apple under state aid, Europeans looking for digital tax, which will go nowhere, basically. Uh, but but we, we, we have this kind of controversial things which will happen. And I think the challenge is that the pendulum, which we see in the economic field of globalization, and maybe a little bit less, is not impeded by this less coordinated public policy type of thing. That's what, what I think we see. Tim's That's original true. pushback against my question is looking way more prescient right now. <laughs> not all things are moving at the same speed yeah. right. and in the same direction. Because what we're talking about is a, essentially a globalization and, and, and becoming more uniform when it comes to taxing capital. Right. But well, very different treatments of things like labor yeah. and, and, and digital space and things like that. Um, I, I don't know that there's a right. appropriate expectation that the world should get easier, but it's not, it doesn't sound to, to me like it's getting easier. No, I mean, it's sort of interesting. I think sometimes we presume, um, or at least people have been alive last 30, 40 years, sort of presume you're on this upward spiral towards openness. You know, that's kind of just the way, you know, that's kind of what progress is, or, or that's sort of the natural law. Of, and I don't, I think it's, as, as I said before, complicated. I think certain things, as you're suggesting, globalize and globalize, but others start to deglobalize. And sometimes, the this is really complicated, the globalization of one thing can create deglobalization pressures in a different direction. Yes. And I think that's a, you know what I mean, a new pressure to deglobalize something else. Uh, and maybe that's happening with trade right now. I mean, one, if I was making a case for deglobalization, I think uh, taking a hard look at the World Trade Organization's authority and its erosion uh, over the last uh, you know, decade is, is, is serious. Um, the, the current trade war is, as far as I can tell, completely ignoring the dispute resolution process uh, of the WTO. And, you know, the dispute resolution process is what was used to, to open Japan. You know, they weren't particularly uh, open to, to the threats, but once everything became a WTO proceeding, it started becoming more legalized. That really seems like it's getting, getting lost. It's just one example. And maybe it's pressure from other forms of of globalization that sets you know, manufacturers in every country to put more pressure, elect leaders who want to do that. So it's a pretty complicated, uh, pretty complicated equation. There's nothing inevitable about globalization, right? right? The last era of globalization ended in 1914. Right? So and we know how it ended. And even if we're not you know, necessarily headed for World War III, right, we certainly are moving to an era where a multilateral approach to trade, to taxation, to, uh, uh, to any standards. kind of issue, it's become yeah, common standards, and they regulation is being increasingly questioned. And they yes. said we couldn't go to war in world, before World War I because we were too economically connected. That's right. I worry... Totally false. It was, didn't turn out to be very true at all. Um, I, I worry that we forget the reason why we globalized the world. And we globalized the world, well, in part because we decided it was better to try that than to shoot at each other. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and I was interested in a story the other day, and I don't know exactly where we head with this idea, but um, as a person that does a lot of the polling and surveys at CNBC and, and, and has been polling on trade, that there was a story that said Republicans in the Midwest were angry about the impact of trade potentially and the trade wars, and it struck me that there's no natural constituency for trade until someone tries to take it away. It's one of those things where, what was it Milton Friedman talked about, the invisible benefits of it versus the visible. You can see the right. decline in the factories and the gutted areas where the factories were, but the extra two cents that everybody gets off that aggregates up into billions and tens of billions from the benefits of free trade, that's invisible, essentially, yeah, until right. somebody takes it away. So this is what gives me a little bit of hope that when you see that kind of 
pushback against yeah. it, then I, then I get, I, I'm saying, okay, we're not at least going to take a full two steps backwards. Maybe it's but a one step. There, there's a collective action problem, right? The benefits from trade are very widely spread and the costs are very concentrated. And it's a lot easier to organize when you pay a very concentrated cost. Now, the good news is that here, new technology you know, makes it a lot easier for people to get organized. So we may get, thanks to Facebook, uh, some kind of pushback against the deglobalization because people that have something to lose but not necessarily their livelihood may get organized and uh, turn out to vote together. Er Erwin, I, 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 I want to button up the trade yeah. thing here and I want Erwin to do so. Erwin, do you, how do you see this whole thing, this whole current episode ending? Will there be retaliatory and back and forth tariffs between the United States and China? So, and again, you know, from a trade standpoint, and one thing I want to talk about as I look at what we're talking about is looking ahead in the futures and millennials and Gen Z and how that will change everything. I, I think there is going to be backlash. I think it's important today how we're going to deal with it now. You know, one of the big things that all these, whether it's Amazon today and you know, Alibaba, um, and it's, it's, you know, the meetings that are happening abroad in China and India, trade doesn't come up. It's I want the products, okay? Mm -hmm. And how do we figure out a way we'll get them there? And, you know, I think there's a lot of hype on trade, mm -hmm. but again, at the end of the day, I think it either just goes away or we end up a way to deal with it. Go ahead, yeah. it's, It might go away, but the institutions, you said this on WTO, right. yeah. the institutions are much weaker, yeah. and the coordination between the institutions is weaker. Yeah. And the new currency on, on that area might be relationships. Right. Yeah? The bilateral, as your administration is yeah. playing it, yeah. or, I mean, the Europeans are trying to play the same game basically trying to have special relationships in your administration, not institutional ones. And in the, I think in the field where we see it, it's the same thing. It's trying to have relationship mm -hmm. with the regulator one, with regulator two, regulator three, to get this done. But the new currency in this less coordinated world is relationships. Can I bring up one? I, I, I know you want to button this up, but there's one country we haven't mentioned I think is relevant, especially to your point about national security or, or, or frankly, uh, international uh, tension, you know, spilling over into trade problems. You know, 30 years ago, it was hoped that Russia would become a full-fledged member at some point of the world trade situation, you know, world trading OECD, organization. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And now, I mean, and, and, and uh, you know, look at the situation now. Look at this. There's been sanctions on, on Russia. Um, you know, the, if the country, we're obviously not at war, but we're close to military conflict in, in Syria. And you know, these are kind of the things that would suggest a sort of pessimistic story. Is I mean, the idea of making uh, Russia full-fledged member of the WTO right now seems kind of no one would even think about it. While in the 90s, people were hoping it's going to happen. There's even questions whether China. So that, that's another kind of piece of evidence. And Russia hasn't really been discussed much. But I mean, the, the, if conflict continues, you can see that natural spillover even even greater of the kind you talked about, the post-1914 kind of stuff. Well, Russia was. I'm the predicting focal, World War in other I, mean, I, I, I <laughs> Russia was the focal point. Right. of hope in, in, in the 90s. It was, it was the end of history, right? Yes. The, the, we, the conflict was over between capitalism and communism, between democracy and authoritarianism. And, and, and that's a cautionary note, right? That's a cautionary tale for everybody in this room when you think, because I was part of that thinking. I was in Russia from 92 to 98 working for the Wall Street Journal. Mm -hmm. um, and, and there was a sense of optimism and hope that it would turn out okay. Um, and I don't think it had to turn out as bad as it did, but that's a different conversation. I think people forgot about the enduring um, attractiveness of fascism, basically, and, and, and state-directed economies. And you know nationalism. What I mean? Sorry? Extreme nationalism also. Yeah, well, really. I mean, but, but also, the cautionary tale there is the ability of the government to continue for a very long period of time doing, doing things that are really stupid and bad for its people. I mean, it, it's, it's worth pointing out that a lot of economists think about China subsidizing its steel industry and say the right answer to that 
is to buy as much possible steel from China yeah. as we can. Right. If it hurts them and costs them every time they make a ton of steel, we ought to buy a lot of steel. And it's the opposite conclusion of what others come to. Mm. But uh, let, me, let me button up the trade but deal. Steve, I, I just think that you talked about from a farmers today and how the farmers are, you know, are angry at, you know, from a trade agreement. And we're a big buyer of almonds now from our benefit. You know, when the Chinese crop would not come in, they, China would come in here and buy the crop and the farmers would be very happy and drive up prices. Now, from my standpoint, it's great that prices, you know, will remain low, but I, I think the farmers suffer tremendously if there's all these, you know, shifts, shifts in trade and stuff yeah, like that. They, they, that's right. I want to uh, turn to another thing that seemed inexorable a few years ago and isn't any longer, which is Facebook. And Jim, <laughs> it's a nice place to start with you again on this issue because you've written a lot about this. Um, yeah. And uh, is this a harbinger of, again, a global movement to rein in something that seemed like it was on its way to careening out of control and out of the grasp of government to regulate? Uh, yes, I, I think so. Um, you know, whether it is uh, Facebook it, itself or whether it's, you know, similar targets, I think there's certainly a rising uh, sense that the shall we say, regulatory honeymoon enjoyed by Silicon Valley, where you know, I spent a lot of my career, um, is, uh, is over. Uh, you know, it's most obvious in Europe, and I think it's been obvious in Europe for, for almost, almost a decade. Um, but I think it's becoming increasingly a question in the United States. You know, and I'll just mention three sort of areas. The, the uh, tech industry um, has uh, you know, a set of immunities from, from laws under, under law in section uh, 230. Um, it has enjoyed kind of a pass on, on serious antitrust enforcement. Right. Uh, it has allowed, uh, mergers have, in the United States, not in Europe, uh, merge, it's, got, it's, had, it's been able to complete mergers. Um, Facebook managed to buy uh, two of its major uh, obvious rivals, um, Instagram and WhatsApp, in the 2010s, and therefore kind of uh, eliminate the most obvious threats to its um, uh, domination of its industry, and those were given kind of a free pass. Um, and uh, I think when you combine these various uh, things, I think the tech industry shows every sign of coming under, I guess what some critics would call normal scrutiny, the tech industry would call an unwarranted uh, effort to, to kill the golden goose. But I think that the trend is, is uh, undeniable. Yeah. On, on, on Facebook, the, the European reaction will come after the US. But they, they are encouraged, the European regulators are encouraged. Right. by the congressional beating. Or but the maybe. Europeans have already done something, right? They've yeah, already got a deal. This, but this, right. is, this comes now. Every jurisdiction will get Facebook into their own, own yeah. regulatory economy. And the real conflict <coughs> behind this is the right who owns which data. Is this more an individual right, or is this something which is then in the global type of arena? And this bounces back at the moment. Yeah. And this is at the core of the business models of Silicon Valley. Right. If the data ownership is bouncing back legally, and the European regulators are using this trend at the moment to go against the Silicon Valley business model. You know? Well, yeah, the fangs will have their fangs pulled, I think. Uh, um, it, it, it's obvious. They are partly, of course, enormously technically innovative, <coughs> but much more important for their business success is the fact that they're unregulated Right? And that they get away with stuff, and untaxed, in fact, when it comes to, uh, to Amazon in terms of its, uh, yeah, uh, this sure. exemption. So all kinds of strange advantages over the, over the competition that will go. Uh, it's, it's, uh, look at Uber and uh, Airbnb. Right? Yes, the platforms are really enhancing, but the reason why they're so competitive is that all their workers count as self-employed. So no benefits. You know, uh, and minimal regulation. And the same with Airbnb. They're not regulated like hotels. But look, look what it's created in jobs. Look what it's changed. I mean, it, you say it's not regulated, but let me tell you, how many are going to walk out of here today? These are ugly oh, monopolies. But call, get a well. Uber out there. I come back and say this here, Amazon. Mm -hmm. You know, there's $800 billion of food sold in the U.S. Amazon will sell over 
$100 billion in the next couple of years. And just think, you don't have to go to a supermarket. You're not going to have the emissions in the air driving to supermarkets and congestion out there. You'll be able to have within an hour delivered to your home. And, and you know, I come back with Airbnb and yes, you know, it is the biggest provider of hotel rooms today. And yes, they don't own anything, but look the deals you can get. You talk about... Erwin, I need to interrupt yeah. to make sure that people understand the profoundly skeptical analysis of Willem when it came to the technology companies. Yeah. Huh. Because, and, and, and I don't agree wholeheartedly with you, but I think it's a really important you agree distinction. With me? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm going I'm to agree with both <laughs> I mean, of you. I'm just but but, but Willem, let me, let me finish yeah. the point here because it's a very critical one that I think mm -hmm. is important from an investor and an outlook. Do not confuse technological progress with regulatory arbitrage. <laughs> and some of what these companies have done is regulatory arbitrage, and some of what they've done is real technological yes, progress. Absolutely. I don't think you're half right. I think you may be, in some cases, 20 or 30 percent right. And I think what Erwin's talking about, no, 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 I think what Erwin's talking about are real developments, but now layering in what Tim was talking about, when the government, or the government gets involved, as we like to say here, that regulatory arbitrage goes away, mm -hmm. values come down, back down to earth, mm -hmm. when we start talking about Amazon paying taxes, Uber paying um, social, service. social services, social. and wages and things like that, and that's when you have a, you know, a coming to God from a level of, of playing field. Right. Well, to, Jim, no, I, I just, I think, and Erwin, uh, I'm going to let you pick up on that. I'm not right, going to let you guys right, go sure no, I, we I understand wanna, what was on the table. And also, I want to talk about two different types of government action because I think they're relevant. One, one category is what you're talking about, which is a sort of uh, effort to make uh, Silicon Valley live by the same rules as everyone else. Yeah. Maybe the clearest example is that you know Amazon should pay taxes in, in every state or something like that. But or they do whatever. pay taxes. What, or, 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 well, they, no they, pay, I, they obviously pay some taxes, but they should pay sales taxes. Every internet business, they pay. Well, I, look, I'm not trying to take this. I'm just saying yeah. that's an, one example. Yeah. The second category is sort of, sort of different, and that's uh, to do with revival of antitrust scrutiny, which yeah. I, I think is a, a very uh, a different kind of trend than the, the regulatory trend. Uh, it's a law enforcement trend. And um, that one, has, there's a very important distinction, I think, there, which a little reflects this difference you're talking about. Which is, if you think, if you want to try to project who's going to come under heavy antitrust scrutiny, which is a worthwhile project for people interested in the economy, uh, I think it has a lot to do with this question of disruptiveness. And we'll start to see a distinction maybe between, on the one hand, something like Amazon uh, trying to take on the health, uh, health insurance industry, which I think an anti from an antitrust perspective, seems fantastic, you know, because they're, they're disrupting that industry, trying to bring lower costs, uh, uh, or, or, or what they're doing for groceries or something. You notice that the merger on Whole Foods got a, got a pass pretty, pretty quickly. And what might be... Do it might have not today if... Uh I, I don't think... I know, I still think so. And, and, the, I, I, and what might be seen as efforts to just defend themselves, entrench the monopoly, you know, buy up potential competitors. So I think that that is going to that kind of difference between the sort of disruptive and defensive tech may play a large role. And the AT&T case, the government theory right now to try right. and stop AT&T from buying Time Warner is it's all about defense. You know, they're just trying to keep their their prices high and prevent um, people from uh, cord cutting and, and saving money. It's roughly the theory. So I think that that's an important distinction that's going to then start play out. And when you talk about regulation, it's important to talk difference between just putting back these rules other people's have, and then also uh, firing up the antitrust engines, which is certainly happening in, in this country. Um, uh, not something people expected, but uh, one of, another one of those Trump promises that surprisingly turned out to be true. Um, Erwin, I'm, I want to turn and pivot to something that uh, you and I have in common, which is we apparently have boys about the same age. And let's talk about some of the annoyances. He steals my chargers all the time. Mine too. Okay. So somebody riddle me how he can leave chargers all over town, but no chargers end up in my house. <laughs> Doesn't make any sense. The, th the other thing that happens is um, I come in in the morning when I get, when I get up in the morning at uh, 5 a.m. or so, <laughs> I have to change from streaming back to cable. Um, he's different. I mean, we like the same music, which is kind of cool. Um, that's surprising. And we, 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 we <laughs> play the same band. Okay. We, we, um, but 
there's a lot of things that are different, and, and some of the things that we're talking about here, some of these forces are going to be changed by this group of people right now who are coming to age. And I know you have very strong thoughts about how that's going to happen and what is going to happen. So I'm going to give you the floor on that. So Steve and I, I have four kids, and from 22 to 14, and live here in New York City. And I learn every day from my kids, everything from my kids. I learn from their, my kids, my friends, their friends, what they're buying, what they're doing, as, as, as Steve said. Um, you know, I never forget, my kids used to go to school, they used to have these big backpacks of books. Now, like, the backpack they have is their sports equipment. Um, I joke about my 22-year-old daughter when I ask her, open up a can of soup, and she looks at me and says, how do I open up a can? And if I didn't know how to open up a can, you think I'm going to have anything that comes out of a can. We've talked about being a vegetarian, a vegan today. We own a, a major chicken business. We never would use the word slaughter. It's all processed today. How many people here know what a B Corp is and every corporation to become a B Corp and sustainability? So these are things that my 17 and 18 year olds talk about today. And that everything they order, my house has a mud room or a delivery room, like a mail room, because they don't go to a store, they've never been to a bank. Um, the best thing I say to my son the other day, I saw Seamless come, I said, Garrett, why do you order Seamless? You know, Dos Taurus is around the corner. He said, Dad, it's $1.50. Wouldn't you rather me doing my homework instead of spending $1.50 on Seamless? So again, this group, this generation of Gen Z and Millennials will continuously change this world tremendously. And here we talk about trade, here we talk about products, ingredients, and that. And I, I see it happening, and I've seen it, you know, our sons are 18, 19 years old as they go off. I've seen the evolution and change, and it, it's just amazing what will happen out there with them. And, and I say this here, the job that they will get at a college has not been created yet. How does that group, which I'm always a little skeptical, by the way, I'm, I'm a little concerned that the word millennial and Gen X and Gen Y is something invented by Gen Z. Gen Z. Yes. And, and something invented <coughs> by consultants to make sure that you spent some money for your corporation with them <laughs> to understand that there was a different generation coming. And I, I, I'm always a little skeptical that all they are is younger and not substantially different from younger people 20 years earlier before that. But that said, I know they've grown up with screens, um, and, and the C, I, I, this is not profound to say that it's, I've walked in on my son in the uh, TV room, and there he's been three screens deep. I don't even understand that. But he's playing video games. He, well, he's got something here, some on the computer, yeah. and the TV on. Yeah. It's, uh, um, but how does all that work into the, the globalization story and the trade story? Tim, you want to pick up on that? Well, I want to share uh, your skepticism and, and echo it uh, in the sense that this, this idea of, of you know, analyzing next generation talk, I mean, obviously there's going to be some differences, but that, I think that really started in, in the 60s, 70s, when there was a very dramatic difference between Huge. the people in their 20s and people in their 50s, so much so that the companies that were able to understand you know, the people who were the counterculture and somehow brand themselves as groovy had this sort of advantage for, for a temporary <laughs> period. I, I kind of am with you that I'm not sure, other than sort of in some small details or that, you know, they've never seen a, a compact disc or something like that, whether their patterns really are is different, especially yeah. as compared to the, you know, counterculture area. I don't, I don't know. I mean, um, I haven't really learned anything from my kids, actually, but, you know, they're four. <laughs> <laughs> One and a half. So. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if Stefan, you wanted to pick up on that, well. I'll give Irwin I've learned how to, you know, try I mean, to adjust my My, my son is 22, studied in Switzerland, now works in London, applied for a job with an American bank, and same competition for this job, like we applied for jobs. I think there was not so, there I'm a little bit with you. It's, it's not such a huge difference, I think, from, from the things we experience. The thing which will stay, whatever happens in, in, in the rest, is this now the globalized labor market or job market. Mm -hmm. 
That will stay, whatever comes well, of I mean, that raises an interesting question for Willem, which, which is because to, to grow up and not believe that you are ordained to do better than your parents, mm -hmm. but also to grow up, and I don't know that my kids feel this, and I don't know how many millennials feel this. In fact, maybe we'll poll for this, to the extent to which people actually feel they're in a global labor market, Willem, rather than a domestic one. Oh, uh, for what it's worth, my kids are 24 and 27, so that's uh, <laughs> sort of millennial-ish. And uh, they definitely know that they're working in a, in a global labor market. It helps that they have three passports <laughs> each, right? Uh, but they are, as students, they uh, were aware, and one of them still is aware, of the fact that there will be global competition yeah. when, they, when they get out. And they are ready, basically, to, uh, to move cross-border if necessary, if things don't work out here. So there is a totally different attitude. I, I don't know, I think, whether the generation is truly different. I, I'm amazed by the maturity, age-adjusted, of, of this younger generation, actually. They seem to have much better judgment than uh, I had at the time that I was their age. Uh, I think they seem to be much more focused. Uh, they're, not, uh, they're not focused on, <coughs> on wealth as an aim in itself, but they have a very instrumental view that you need to make an income to do the things you want to do. So it is a, I think it's a rather nice attitude towards materialism. Well, they I'm don't what, have children themselves. Instrumental <laughs> materialism. Well, I'm what, uh, talk about the, the macro outlook for folks like that, yeah, right? The idea that you have um, the aging of populations in advanced economies. The math is that they have to work a lot harder to pay for our retirement, right? And their own. And I, their own. I, I, I've told my kids, uh, you're not going to retire until you're 85, right? And uh, start saving now. There should be no retirement age. Yeah, no, there is. The, but I mean, they will retire at 85 because the, so the, the notion, uh, I mean, it's, it's going to be a really rough time for them because they will have to save uh, both to support us and to support themselves living 100 years or more. Right? Uh, with the risk-adjusted rates of return but on they, investment being lower than they've they been. They have the heritage. Years. They get something from your generation. They, they get, they get a, they, but unfortunately, we only got right. one house. Yes, and, and there's two. <laughs> <laughs> and, with, and with two kids, that's a bit of a problem. Okay, that's just, I, I, um, I, I think they are uh, facing an enormous challenge here. Uh, population aging and uh, longevity increasing uh, will make this generation one that uh, assets will never be able to retire, for better or worse. Um, for the rest, I'm more optimistic about technological change than I think some of the culture pessimists and other economists are. I mean, you have all heard the parable of the low-hanging fruit, right? Or the tree of knowledge has all been plucked. You know, we have, we did fire, we did the wheel, we did horses, you know, we did coal, electricity, chemical industries, and now all we have left poor us is artificial intelligence, machine learning, robotics, and uh, uh, nanotechnology. I think that's nonsense. And I do think that um, we don't see the results of these fantastic innovations we're seeing. The tree of knowledge is, in fact, growing steadily, right? And there's more fruit on it than there ever was. Now, uh, learning, uh, discovery is an increasing returns process. The more you know, the easier it becomes to learn more. I'm, I'm convinced of that, so I'm not pessimistic there. But it has to be embodied, this new knowledge, these new inventions, in people or equipment or machinery. And we are in an era of low investment. Low investment in machinery and low investment in people. Education, right? Secondary education in the two countries I have passports of, the UK and the US, is a disgrace, right? We're not preparing our kids properly, so there's an issue there. But uh, if we change that, then I think they will be able to tell their kids that they won't be able to retire until they're 150. <laughs> I'm the last year of the baby boom, which means I will never retire but always have a job. So I'm psyched. It's fine. <laughs> it's fine with me. Well, it is interesting. You know, we talk about this narrative of whether you know, we're kind of this, this onward right. step towards yeah. progress, more wealth, whatever, or whether things are cyclical or change in different directions. And to think about things that uh, in the middle class some of the things that now seem like luxuries or the province of the rich that used to be more 
kind of normal. And one, you know, for example, um, uh, retirement is one example. You know, the idea you'd take off uh, you know, 30 years of your life, uh, take it easy. Um, also, um, there's a strange thing where, you know, productivity is supposedly increased. We have all these amazing technologies and so forth, but uh, many households feel they have to have two people working in order to, to make ends meet, while somehow, you know, 40 years ago, you could have one person. Now, often that was because of gender roles and things like that, but, you know, somehow it was considered fine to have one salary, and that, that would be fine. I think most, most uh, middle-class families feel they have to have two people working to be, to be even in the middle class, and um, I think housing has gotten more. It depends where you're talking about. Housing's gotten more expensive. We're in New York, of course, where having a garage means you're incredibly wealthy. But, but I mean, in so, so, some sense, uh, you know, housing. So it seems like sometimes we've gotten wealthier and less wealthy at the same time in ways that are Tim, I, I, hard I to worry, understand. I worry a lot about living through great times and not knowing it. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, my, my son sent me a, uh, from college a, uh, a quiz about asking what percent of women around the world go to school. What percent of the world has an average lifespan of 70 years? What percent of the world is electrified? What percent of the world has clean water? In each case, apparently, the average taker of this quiz answers the worst possible answer. In each case, the best possible answer is true. It's quite amazing. Um, I also think that we have a delusion of nostalgia we look back to an era in the 50s, which was only a single generation, mm -hmm. when those factory jobs, a single person on a factory job could support an entire family. It was only in the post-war period that that even existed. And in fact, they bought labor peace at the time with promises of pensions in the future they could not deliver upon. Sure. And so we're in some measure paying for that. Um, Erwin, I want to hear your sense as a businessman, and you don't have to agree with me, of optimism or pessimism as to the overall trajectory here. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and I'll just add one more editorial comment, which is, well, um, the problem of living longer is certainly better than the other problem. <laughs> that's what, I, I understand that that's there are you huge can move your elbows financial day, right? issues that, that, are, that, that go along with it. Yeah, yeah. That's but what, but I, I, I sure prefer that one to the other one. And, and Erwin, let me, let me throw the question to you. So, Steve, we have to live longer. I got four tuitions <laughs> four in school, okay? <laughs> let me tell you, you know what four tuitions are like today. Um, listen, I, I, I come back and just, you know, I got to touch on the whole thing about retirement and where's the retirement age. And, you know, some of the problems facing all our companies today are these unfunded pensions, and their companies are basically bankrupt. Mm -hmm. And it, living on cash flow, and you got, you know, billions of dollars on funded pensions, and that's kind of what happened in the car industry and uh, GE and a lot of these companies. So, again, it was like work, 60, 65, you retire, we buy you out, and I think retirement age should go away, you should be able to work for forever, and there's a lot of brain power. In a lot of cases, we got labor shortage out there, and it shouldn't be, you know, if you're, you're 65, I think... You know, I come back and I say this here, diseases today, whether it's Alzheimer's, whether it's dementia, the brain got to keep working. So I, I'm out there, you got to keep working. Any, and then anybody ever says to me the word, I'm going to retire, I'm going to retire, don't retire, don't move to Florida, don't play golf and wake up in the morning for your breakfast, then your lunch, and then your six o'clock dinner because I think you all you got problems. So, you know, I, I come back and, I, and, and, and again, um, Listen, I think the world from a, whether it's globalization, uh, not globalization, I think the opportunities, I came to this country in 1983. I grew up in a household with five kids. My father made $35,000 his best year. I didn't go to Harvard, I didn't go to Penn. And in 1993, I said, I'm gonna start a company that's gonna change the way the world eats. Today we got over 10,000 employees. We got um, sales over three and a half, four billion dollars around the world. And I was not nowhere as smart as Steve's sons, my sons, and a lot of people in here. So I think there is so much opportunity in this world. Mm -hmm. I think again, you got to have the fire in your belly, and you got to have the ability to go out there and get it. Now again. 
as helicopter parents. <laughs> and we don't want our kids to fall down. And you know, it's amazing, it drives me crazy. As soon as a kid falls down, a mom or dad runs and gets a white wipe, wipe, a wiper to wipe their hands, a wet wipe. Let our kids fall down. Go do things, make mistakes, don't retire. And I gotta tell you, we'll be in a lot better world. But, and Stefan, you don't also wanna believe you're at the time when everything's been invented and all the disruptions have happened. We're, we're living through a time right now, the, the last survey we did on CNBC, for CNBC was the idea that 60% uh, of households are streaming right now. 20% are streaming only. So the thing that came along that disrupted everything about TV, which was cable, is now facing its own disruption, and the cycle just goes right on. Right. I, I think just on, on this overall looking ahead, what I'm hearing from you is, I mean, it's the, the classical American dream, yeah? You, you, this is what, what and, and what is really fascinating for me listening to you is, you believe in that dream. And I, <laughs> I, I, I think your kids will believe in that as well if they come from your family. It's not a belief, it's reality. Yeah, it's, you, it's you, reality. You, yeah. It's a dream made reality. There was one day it was a dream, yeah, okay. but then the dream was over and it woke up. And yeah, but, but that's, <laughs> I, coming from your, that's for me the, the, the fascinating, always the fascinating place here. Well, you know, that's when, I was, when I was in Russia, all the Russians thought Americans were stupid. And the reason is because we were happy and optimistic all the time. Yeah. If we were smart, we'd understand how terrible life was. <laughs> you think the Russians think we're stupid today? <laughs> and and uh, I think, just to finish this up, I think we, we have to keep this, let's say, learn from, from you and from this optimism, on the other hand, to overcome the tendencies which we see in, in our day-to-day -day jobs uh, more complex things, more uncoordinated things, more investigation, things like that. I think we have to keep this type of optimism, you tell them whatever terrorists there will be, we'll get it done, yeah? To, to keep this whole together in, in a working environment. And I think that's the challenge for next two years, something like that. <laughs> uh, Tim? Yeah, on this, somehow we've gotten into national psychological profiles. So <laughs> kind of a, you know, I think there's some help, if we're going to try to relate this to the economic uh, uh, policy or economic yeah. uh, views, you know, I think there's something to be said um, uh, for optimistic and pessimistic cycles. Uh, I think we're in a more, in the, especially in tech, in a slightly more pessimistic place right now than my industry seems like. There's a lot of criticism of, of tech and what, what it's done. Um, it's, uh, but you know, incredible, there was before that 20 years of incredible optimism. They both have their blind spots. And I think if you're, you know, unrelentingly optimistic uh, about, say, the tech industry, you don't, you don't have any sense of the cost that might be extracting it. it uh, you, know, you can't sort of pause and repair. Anyone who's put a team together need, knows you need like a mixture of people who are, you know, very gung-ho and a couple of people who are at least slightly uh, critical. And I think that's uh, pretty important to have a, you know, even for a country to, to, to sort of fix itself, that it occasionally pauses to think maybe it's going slightly in the wrong directions. You can go too far, you can have countries that are just way too dark and, you know, continually pessimistic, and also uh, that's a problem too. But I think there's got to be some healthy cycle. And there's, also the a, cycle. there's also a cycle where the technology outpaces the society's ability to deal with it and handle it. That's right. always been the case. I mean, and, and for example, you know, how we govern Twitter and Facebook. I mean, we're just, it's the same thing with mm -hmm. the development of computer and computer networks and financial movement uh, that you could argue was part of the reason we had the financial crisis to begin with. Right, right. We didn't really understand how to regulate those True. markets and then yeah. we did it and, and, and it caught up with us and, and, and then we regulated it and we sort of appear at least for the moment to have it under control. Yeah, and I, mean, I think like, think Facebook, I think it was a little too pan Panglossian an attitude in Silicon Valley, you know, surrounding privacy or opening elections to manipulation by foreign powers. We're just like, well, everything's fine, and you know, this yeah. is the future, and we're just tech, you know, I'm, I'm sort of giving Facebook's version of it, and I think people are like, well, maybe we need to think about this again. So I think it'd be very healthy. Yeah, I, I think blind yeah. optimism is dangerous, right, and unproductive. I'm not saying that the human race is necessarily an evolutionary dead end, but we have to, you know, we, we, ha <laughs> we have to look at a possibility if we want to take the right actions, right? <laughs> Including for the environment. 
I myself, you know, am of Dutch extraction, and Dutch optimism, I think, goes a long way, because the Dutch optimist says, no matter how bad things are, they can always get worse. <laughs> <laughs> I am not going to allow the panel to end on that. We are on the yeah. last three and a half minutes. Um, my American optimism forbids it. Well, um, we did not have a chance to talk about the economy, which I wanted to talk about oh, well. in, in a more of a sort of a macro standpoint. We were afraid that if we started there, we would have put the crowd firmly to sleep. Um, but So we just spared the last three minutes. Um, we're in a bit of a lull here in the U.S., but we've had stronger growth. Uh, IMF recently upgraded its world economic growth forecast. Are you... Am I an idiot for even asking this? Are you optimistic about growth? Um, well, when the IMF does something, whether it's up or down, right, always take the opposite position and you'll be rich. Right? <laughs> uh, I, uh, I think that growth is reasonably robust and likely to remain so. Uh, yes, the US had a lousy Q1, right? It's been that way every five uh, for the last five years, so I no longer pay any attention to it. I think that with the fiscal stimulus, we will, unfortunately, get significantly higher than sustainable growth this year and the next. Um, no, tax reform was necessary in the yes. U.S., yes. but uh, fiscal stimulus was not. It's deeply... Some persecuted. people said we didn't do fiscal re tax reform. We just did a... No, no, no. Tax there cut. has definitely been tax reform. A lot more is required, right, including in personal income taxes. I like to tell the story. My wife and I are both PhDs in economics, right? And we can't do our U.S. income taxes. Absolutely no way. <laughs> right? Completely incomprehensible. So you really have to change that. No PhD. Um, in the so I, um, uh, I don't see. So you didn't any... file on the 17th, don't we? Now, you late filing? <laughs> hey, you don't have to. Have, you know, that's not the kind of question. Uh, I, uh, I, get, <laughs> I, get, I get other people to do it for me. Yeah. Yeah. That, yeah, so you pay through the nose to. So you think we can continue at stronger growth? I will. Let me just add for the, the next other, couple of years. Yes. The, the other it won't layer. Be a recession until 2020. So don't. But worry. you think there is a snapback from the end of fiscal stimulus? In oh yes, 20? absolutely. Uh, if it isn't the market freaking out because we have six six and a half percent deficit as a share of GDP, uh, it will be the Fed that will respond to the you know uh, I think excessive growth that we're going to see for the rest of this year and into 2019. But the pain won't be felt in 2020. So rejoice. Erwin, can you talk about <laughs> Erwin, can you talk about your businesses and your book of business and how that looks in terms of looking forward this year? You know, I'm seeing toughness here in the US. Tough in the US. Uh, tough in the US. Um, you know, inflation, um, costs going up, trying to get <laughs> price increase through. I got my first price increase through since 2015. Wow. And I'll tell you, trucking, commodities, labor has gone up tremendously. And when you walk into Walmart, Amazon, Kroger, and tell them you're getting a 4 to 6% price increase, they don't give you roses and a hug, okay? It's so, um, but we, we, are, we are faced with some serious inflation here and trying to get pricing is, and trying to get growth is real difficult. But I will tell you, what I'm seeing coming out of the UK, Europe, Middle East, India, rest of the world, Canada, I am really excited and seeing great things coming out of there. But it's tough in the US right now. One sentence on Europe. I think the, um, as you see, growth is, let's say, solid, but the risks are probably this year, Italy, and uh, every, year, Italy. every year Italy, but this year Italy with an unstable, unstable political environment, I think substantial. Second risk is whether the EZB gets a managed landing on the uh, quantitative easing, a managed landing on the quantitative easing, and the third is, do we manage Brexit right? Mm -hmm. These are the three things yeah, we yeah, have yeah. to watch. Well said. We're unfortunately in a place that only Stephen Hawking would, would uh, appreciate. We're in negative time right now. <laughs> so uh, please join me in thanking the panel. <laughs>